Okay, we're gonna try this again. Can everybody hear me? If you can put in the group chat. Hopefully we're back on now. Okay, good, awesome. All right, thanks for everybody for um, hanging tight with us. Um, as you know, we've had a couple of technical difficulties and that's what happens with these things. Um, but we're just gonna keep on rolling with it. Um, we're gonna ask a couple of trivia questions and then I'm gonna um, kick it over to um, Control Up. So the first question and put it in your group chat, don't put it in the Q&A because we won't see it there. So put it in the group chat and the first person, um, I will um, send you over um, an email to uh, get your prize. So how many presidents were born in North Carolina? And let's see. Oh, it looks like we already have a winner. So Wayne M, the answer is two. So the um, presidents are James Polk and Andrew Johnson. Congrats, Wayne, and I will get that um, email over to you shortly. Um, all right, the next one is, what design is on the tail side of the Georgia State Quarter? Anybody? Yep, looks like Ryan D is the winner. All right, congrats. And I will, again, I'll get that email over to you in just a second. All right, so next up is Control Up. We are gonna have Marcel um, present um, for Control Up for us today. Hi, Marcel. Um, and we'll Hello. just go ahead and kick it off to you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to uh, briefly introduce you to the control op console and the control op solution overall. Uh, we connect to the hypervisors. We can connect to the Citrix environment, both on-prem and Citrix cloud, and I'll touch in detail on that. Bring information from multiple data sources to aid you on troubleshooting your issues. Uh, for example, for performance-wide issues in the environment, you could kick it up to the hypervisors, identify a specific issue in a hypervisor, uh, maybe a data store IOPS, drill down to the VMs, view where you'll see the number of VMs on that specific hypervisor and identify the culprit, drill down further in to the users, pinpoint the user where it's happening and get to the processes. So in a handful of clicks, identify what is that user running and take action directly from here. And we can gladly show you more detail on this. Now, for any Citrix environment, of course, there will be a priority to look at your sessions and identify if any user session is having stress level. And we'll find users that uh, their stress might be based on resource consumption. Uh, other users, their stress is not based on resource consumption. And you can pinpoint here very quickly that this user, Jim, is having log duration issues. And just by clicking on that box, you can get uh, the ability to further troubleshoot that and identify the causes of log duration. I already ex executed this action. It takes about 40 seconds to run. And here's the output for that user, Jim, where you could see in detail uh, how long did it take him for, to connect, uh, what held him up during his login, in this case, group policy. And uh, he, within the group policy, which is the group policy that's causing his major source of pain. So very quickly identify any issues pertaining to the user experience. Uh, taking it back to talk about Citrix Cloud, we have the ability to monitor the cloud connectors. Uh, and a quick double, cl double click on the cloud connectors will show us the state on our cloud connectors. Are they connected or not, updated or not? Uh, they seem to be running one version behind. And also, you're able to drill down into the metrics of what's happening in that machine and identify down to the process level uh, what is happening on those machines. 
Um, I know that there'll be a session later on on what is happening with on, on IGEL. And I just wanted to stress that if I, uh, you, we also can pull in data from IGEL, and here I have two users connected to PVS ZenApp servers. I can identify them by the ITC prefix of their client name, and I can initiate directly from control up a shadow of their session. I know I'm running fast, but hopefully we'll be able to catch this and definitely be able to discuss this. Uh, here we are looking at a shadow session of that uh, device, and uh, this user seems to be interacting with it. We're leveraging the new web app uh, existing on the IGEL UMS, so you do need to have a, for a fairly recent UMS to do this. Uh, this device is coming through an IJ Cloud Gateway, so definitely works even with remote IGEL devices. Um, lastly, I wanted to touch on one more thing that will be coming out. Um, if you've used Control Up, you've seen Control Up Insights, where a, you have the ability to look at what is happening historically. A, the top insights is giving you what happened yesterday. You have your um, a, your environment assessment where you could see up to one month of data. And we do have plans that will give you one month of data retention. I don't think we have an environment assessment view for a whole month at a time, but we definitely have, I'm sorry, a whole year, but we definitely have it for a whole month. And the last thing, just to touch uh, on it, is um, a lot of you have asked if we could provide a web interface, and this is a live web interface for the data from control up. Uh, you could have summary views uh, with the KPIs for your environment and or drill down to specific users or machines in real time and identify a machine that's in stress, drill down into that machine. And just like I did on the on the full blown console, on the web console, I can identify the processes that are causing this. And this is in real time. Uh, we update the data every every three, every seven seconds. And I know I only had five minutes and I think that does it. So thank you so much for the opportunity and enjoy this next uh, segment. All right, thank you, Marcel. And we are going to um, move on to our next presentation and let me get things pulled up. So our next speaker is Brooke Handler. She is with Citrix and she will be, be presenting Where Are We in the Citrix Cloud Journey. So welcome Brooke. Thanks so much. Hi folks. Um, yeah, let's just go ahead and get started. So I wanted to come today to speak about where we're at in the Citrix Cloud Journey. Um, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. Um, so a little introduction about me. Um, I've never presented at one of these CUGC events, so new face. Um, but I know many of you know Nick Rentalen. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm on transition recently to the customer success enterprise architect team to cover the U.S. commercial space. Um, and so I know he's always presented at these conferences as a way to kind of give back to the CUGC community. So a little background, I'm from Michigan. Um, bleed maize and blue, went to Michigan, um, spent several years in Citrix Consulting based out of Denver, Colorado, um, still live in Colorado and, you know, love running, skiing, biking, hiking, all the Colorado things. So from an agenda perspective, um, the way we're going to start today, oh, flipped backwards, it looks like. You guys can see agenda, right? Um, so we're gonna start by talking about, you know, what's new with the Citrix cloud control plane? You know, what are some of the compelling features um, that might entice you to, to move your Citrix uh, environment up to the Citrix cloud control plane? Um, then talk about some of the migration considerations, maybe where some of the gaps that are, that still exist, where we may not necessarily have feature parity yet. Um, then talk about, okay, so how do I start then? You know, where do I wanna start on this journey? Um, and then kind of talk about some of the key takeaways that we're seeing on the Citrix side and some of the conversations that I'm having with my customers. Um, I left a slide open for Q&A, although I know we have the round table discussion scheduled for later today. So we'll probably be more so addressing um, questions in that discussion. Okay. 
So in terms of what's new, and, and these are all what's new specific to Citrix Cloud. Um, and I know we have kind of an eye chart here, but there are a lot of things that have been introduced new in the last year. So some of the exciting stuff that's recent has been some of these new scalability limits that the Citrix Cloud control plane is reaching, um, our new automated configuration tool, um, our very, very new horizon migration tool, um, some of the new auto scale capabilities. Um, we have new information around public cloud support, um, some good, some bad. Um, we've changed how studio looks and feels in our Citrix cloud control plane, um, introduced new session admin um, capabilities, which will increase the scalability for our help desk. Um, we introduced rendezvous protocol to get around the, you know, bottleneck of the cloud connectors. Um, we recently introduced new storefront capabilities in 1912C1 that are specific just to Citrix Cloud, um, introduced Citrix concurrent licensing back in May, which is a big win for our healthcare customers. Um, and then the two heavy hitters where Citrix is investing a ton of time and energy is our, our workspace with intelligence capabilities and then our analytics for performance, security, and usage. So I know this is an eye chart. I'm sure you can think of more new functionality that have um, come to Citrix Cloud in the last year, um, but we're just gonna dig into a few of these that I think are, are most important and most compelling, um, you know, maybe reasons to uplift that control plane. So we're gonna jump in and start with our new scalability limits. Um, so in terms of you know what Citrix is doing, um, we have had customers that we you know maybe need to design for the upper limits of our scalability limitations of the Citrix Cloud Control Plane in the last year. So Citrix is constantly working to be able to increase these these numbers to be able to make sure that our customers can exist on like a single tenant or a single um, Citrix Cloud Control Plane. So these are constantly being worked on by our PM team. They're constantly going back into the product and developing. Um, you know, how many concurrent sessions we can have running um, through a single tenant, you know, how many admins like help desk or other admins that can log into the portal. Um, and I even have to log into this, that edocs page myself to see these changing all the time, which is, you know, pretty exciting. So some of the reasons like why this matters is because we are seeing our Citrix cloud deployments reaching some of these scale limits. So I think that's exciting for folks on this call to hear is that, okay, in H1, we were seeing customers get up to that 25K mark. So we do have heavy hitters, you know, on the product running 30,000 concurrent sessions with pretty mission critical workloads. So um, obviously, that's pretty confidence inspiring for customers who maybe aren't, you know, necessarily ready to, to dip their toes into such a risk out control plane to know that we do have big customers utilizing um, CVADS. The other reasons why this matters um, is because some of these downstream services um, are not going to be aggregated. So workspace to be able to enumerate like different site information isn't aggregated, you know, our director information isn't aggregated at this time, and then analytics isn't aggregated at this time. So those downstream services are affected if we maybe had to deploy our customers in like a hub and spoke model. So increasing those scalability limits makes it so that we don't have to do that. We can really have the ability to keep our customers in a single Citrix Cloud tenant um, for even a global deployment. So, you know, I've had customers who run their tenant out of EMEA, although they have workloads in APJ, US, um, all over the place. And it, it's that extensible infrastructure um, we're seeing really work. Um, the other pieces we're seeing significant investment from the product team to be able to improve scalability. And some of the ways that they've done that um, is by updating how the database and PowerShell queries are actually running, um, reducing redundant checks, maybe checking things at runtime instead of periodically. Um, the other piece is they've separated out some of these read and write databases for some of the components um, to kind of decrease the load on those SQL databases. So for example, the monitoring database, um, because we have a read replica when our um, you know, help desk admins need to gather information on a user, a machine, an application. They're able to just pull that information right from the read database instead of, you know, making a query to the right database. So that's all new and exciting. 
Um, the other piece that's kind of new in the last couple of months is Citrix's automated configuration tool. Although most folks right now can probably think of it as a migration tool because the goal is to be able to take your on-premises um, site information and automatically move that up to the Citrix Cloud Control Plane via PowerShell. So I know folks on this call have community tools. There's definitely tools online. Um, I know I've written tools during consulting engagements to move from like 6.5 to cloud migrations. Um, but the key piece here is this is the only tool that's fully supported by Citrix, which I know can be really, really important um, if you maybe run into an issue during that process um, and you have support asking you what you've done. So this is the you know, fully supported migration utility. So in terms of how this works, um, it is an actual MSI file that you would download on your delivery controllers, your on-premises delivery controllers, and you would basically run a command to export all of the information about your on-premises site. Um, and the tool will actually create these YAML files, which are essentially like text files that have a bunch of information about, um, you know, what is going on in your site. So what applications do we have published? What machines do we have tagged or applications do we have tagged? Um, what machine catalogs do we have or delivery groups? So all of that would be a pretty tedious process to move up to the Citrix control plane. And because that like FMA architecture is so similar, um, it's easy to be able to capture these in the text files, um, run the utility and move all that information up to the Citrix control plane so you don't have to replicate work you've already done to publish these applications. Um, so the other piece that you need is actual information on your Citrix cloud control plane. So we've been developing how, like our API tokens in the Citrix cloud control plane. Um, and you would actually grab like your secret key pertinent to just your Citrix Cloud tenant. Um, you would put that in another one of these text files, which just has like your site information, um, and then run an export CVAD um, command, which will actually move all this information up to your Citrix Cloud um, control plane, and you'd be able to see it when you log into Studio there. Um, in terms of caveats, there's some caveats around MCS supportability for catalogs with like specific hosting connections. Um, but for the most part, it really does reduce the amount of work needed to move some of um, these settings up to the Citrix Cloud Control Plane. Um, in addition, obviously, if you're at a juncture point where you're moving from on-prem to Citrix Cloud, you might not want to move everything. Um, so you can actually open up these YAML files and edit them just in Notepad to be able to say, okay, I only want to move, you know, maybe these three catalogs out of my six catalogs up to the Citrix Cloud control plane. So you don't have to actually import the whole site all at once. You can import just pieces of it utilizing the automated configuration tool. The last piece here is at a future state, um, the goal of the tool is kind of more of a, you know, a DevOps model where we're able to synchronize configurations maybe across separate cloud sites um, so that this can actually run at um, not just at a migration time, but just during normal operations for synchronization across various cloud sites. Okay. Another migration tool that was actually announced super recently um, is our Horizon automated migration tool, um, which is another PowerShell utility that's designed to migrate Horizon workloads directly to the Citrix Cloud Control Plane, so you don't have to rebuild your virtual apps and desktops. Uh, and then, as we would say at Citrix, you're gonna you know get a better experience via the HDX technology and the HDX stack. Um, so the way that this works is you would take one of your um, Horizon workloads and go ahead and install the virtual desktop agent um, on the workloads. And what was crazy to me to find out is that once this is installed, users can actually continue to work on their Horizon workloads um, until we complete the migration process and their sessions can remain active. Um, in terms of next steps, you would go to your Horizon Connection server and run the PowerShell utility to export the information on your pools, your publishing information, the actual entitlements themselves. 
um, and you know export that to a file. Then you would move over to um, our PowerShell SDK to run the import command, which will essentially use PowerShell to import all these settings into CVADS and translate them to you know our FMA architecture language. So take them from you know the horizon pools and move them into Citrix machine catalogs and delivery groups and applications. Um, where at that time they'll take over management and delivery of these apps. So once the user authenticates next at storefront or workspace, then their applications and desktops will appear right there. And um, you know they should most likely have a better user experience. Um, so we're out here you know, trying to get the ball rolling. Okay, um, as I mentioned, um, analytics is another piece where Citrix is putting a lot of research and development, and it's actually our foray into AI and machine learning. Um, the analytics product is separated into three different components, our analytics for security, our analytics for performance, and then our analytics for usage. Um, so in terms of our analytics for security, um, it really gets pretty uh, user centric. So we can think about it as if, you know, you have a user that constantly logs in from, you know, Nashville every day, and then all of a sudden they log in from San Francisco at 1 a.m. Then you have a paper trail to say, okay, you know, we have an audit of what this user is doing. We're not going to block them necessarily, but we're collecting this information in Citrix Analytics to say, okay, you know, this is a suspicious behavior. Maybe let's bump down this user security score um, and flag them as like a suspicious user. Um, the performance analytics is also similarly user centric. So um, the performance analytics actually gives the users a um, performance score based on their connection scenario, um, ICA round trip time, similar things that we were seeing in Director, but a little bit more advanced um, with like end to end user and application performance um, to be able to like highlight issues and conduct maybe a root cause analysis. Um, and actually provide a user experience score for individual users, um, which is baselined um, against the actual CVAD environment itself. Um, and then our Citrix Analytics for Usage products just you know, is providing insights into basic usage data of the Citrix products. Um, and the analytics is you know, spanning our solution areas, spanning the Citrix products, um, and you know, across all of our kind of different CVAD and non-CVAD offerings. Okay, one compelling reason to move to Citrix Cloud, um, but difficult conversation that we've had to have with customers over the last year is that we deprecated public cloud support um, for on-premises environments past that 1912 LTSR. Um, so I know probably folks on this call are wondering, you know, but why? Um, and kind of the, the takeaway is that we were doing two things okay, trying to keep pace with all of the enhancements that um, our various public cloud providers are um, delivering, which I mean, they're, you know, moving so quickly. Um, it's difficult for Citrix to keep up. So, you know, Azure is constantly adding new instances, new storage capabilities, disks, tags, etc. cetera. Um, AWS, I mean, completely re-architected their hypervisor down to the actual physical hardware and chips that they were running on um, with their Nitro capabilities and their Nitro-based instances and network cards. Um, GCP is constantly running to try and you know, keep up with, with what Azure and AWS are doing, and they're constantly getting to feature parity um, on some of these various like public cloud offerings. Um, so Citrix made the decision to just move forward with supporting all of those um, essentially, you know, new cloud capabilities just with our, our Citrix cloud product. So this kind of provides a compelling reason to move to Citrix cloud. If you have like a killer current release 2000 plus, 2003 plus feature that you're maybe potentially interested that came out with, you know, 2006 or 2009 in the past few months. Okay, on the topic of 
you know, public cloud support. Um, you know, we had our smart scale product back in the day, which has kind of moved to become our auto scale product, which only exists in the Citrix cloud um, control plane, which basically provides schedule and load based scaling for VDI and host shared workloads. And the benefit here is, you know, primarily around cost savings. Um, I know in the diagram here, we have cost savings 73%, which, you know, is probably a hypothetical use case. But in terms of real world customer data, we're actually seeing like 20 to 40% savings in terms of public cloud consumption costs by being able to schedule when we are turning up and turning down um, those machines hosted on public cloud workloads. Um, so we actually are able, you know, in, in, as an you know, example of this is Citrix is kind of running into this with WVD entering the marketplace. Um, and we can actually see certain scenarios where Citrix licenses can actually pay for themselves just based on the savings in Azure consumption costs by being able to leverage our HDX ICA stack um, and then auto scale uh, to be able to save those those public cloud consumption costs. Um, in terms of how this is configured, um, you know, you set it in the delivery group properties, um, and you can kind of see these cost savings reports right in Director. Um, some of the other scenarios when you would utilize this is maybe if you have some sort of burst scenario um, where you need to leverage public cloud for um, a new workload really, really quickly. Um, maybe that's actually a disaster recovery event that you have to burst up um, and scale up the actual amount of you know, workload servers that you have really, really quickly, um, or maybe high availability across different um, you know, resource locations in your Citrix cloud uh, environment. Okay, so I know, you know, we just jumped through a bunch of really compelling reasons to move to Citrix Cloud, but uh, we wanna make sure we're, you know, covering uh, all of the information. So in terms of migration considerations, um, the way I'm thinking about is, you know, you know, where are we seeing any gaps? Do we have gaps in feature parity? Um, is everything ready to go prime time in the control in, you know, Citrix Cloud? Um, and the honest answer is there are some gaps between, um, especially around like the access tier um, in terms of what we can get with our on-prem product versus what exists in the Citrix Cloud product today. So some of those are around like our workspace service continuity, um, which we'll kind of jump into a teaser on. Um, and then some of the capabilities that we can get only with ADCs and storefronts. So some of that is that authentication flow flexibility with N-Factor, um, some of our site aggregation capabilities that we only have with storefront, um, that HDX and gateway insights that we would need um, ADCs to be able to leverage, um, that EPA or smart access to be able to provide contextual access for, you know, very specific user scenarios. And then like EDT, which is, you know, our lightened data transport protocol um, is just in tech preview for gateway service right now. So the way that I frame this um, typically with customers is we kind of walk through some whiteboards of, you know, what exactly this looks like from an architecture perspective, what we need to consider and maybe how we need to deploy. Um, so as of right now, our Citrix Cloud SLA is around 99.5%, uh, which is you know, a significant amount of potential downtime a year. Um, this obviously exists because we're dependent on a lot of other public cloud services. And if Azure has an outage or AWS has an outage, you know, we're kind of beholden to their SLAs to keep our services up. Um, so let's say there's a scenario where our workspace service is down and, you know, we were utilizing workspace service to enumerate our apps and desktops, or maybe our Citrix virtual apps and desktop service is down and workspace is still up, um, but we can't see our apps and desktop. Um, you know, prior to our new workspace service continuity functionality, that user, you know, wouldn't be able to connect to their BDAs. Um, so the way that we typically whiteboard this out to think about um, maybe how we would get around this today is by leveraging an on-premises access tier. Um, so around 713, um, Citrix introduced the localhost cache technology 
um, in our delivery controllers. And we've ported that technology over to our cloud connectors to be able to leverage them, that technology with the Citrix um, cloud control plane. So you can see in this diagram, I've also drawn out our services for the config sync service, our SQL Express database, and our high availability service, which are those three services that were added around 713 or so. Um, so in the event of a workspace service outage or a virtual apps and desktop service outage, um, essentially what happens in localhost cache mode is our primary brokering services kind of shut down and tell our high availability service, okay, you take over. So our VDAs re-register to that HA service. Um, HA service is using a SQL Express database that's hosted local to that cloud connector to say, you know, what entitlements do my users have access to? And storefronts actually utilizing the HA service to be able to, um, you know, enumerate applications for our end users. So in this scenario, if we're leveraging the Citrix Cloud Control Plane, but we have our storefront on premises, we can leverage the localhost cache technology that exists in the cloud connectors so that when a user connects to storefronts, they can still enumerate the applications through what we can through what's um, delivered in the, the SQL Express database. And then this red line is an actual ICA session. So they can still connect to their applications and desktops because Storefront is able to package an ICA file with the information that localhost cache gave it. So um, as of right now, we're seeing like 75% of our customers move forward with this Storefront on-premises um, access tier. Um, just to make sure they have full continuity because they are probably putting their most mission critical applications um, on Citrix for delivery. So um, in terms of teasing how this is going to look at a future state, um, you know, Citrix is coming out with a service continuity functionality. And I'm sure folks on this call have heard about this coming for a number of years, but it is, you know, getting closer and closer to prime time. Um, but essentially that the way this works is, you know, if we were to experience a workspace service or a Citrix virtual apps and desktop service outage, um, as long as the user had authenticated to their native Citrix workspace app, they would have all of the information necessary on their actual endpoint to be able to enumerate and launch applications in the event of a sort of service outage. Um, so I can't like make any promises on timelines on this call, but if there are folks on this call who are maybe interested in a private tech preview, they you know, can feel free to reach out and we're hoping for a public tech preview sometime fairly soon. Um, so it is exciting that this service continuity feature is coming out, um, you know, is in development and is potentially coming out soon because I think that'll make it much easier for our customers to utilize the workspace service uh, for enumeration of their workloads and get to be able to leverage um, all the new features that are moving into the workspace service. Okay. In terms of some of the other migration considerations, um, the additional piece is also, or some of the additional pieces are also around the access tier and some of that flexibility we have um, around like authentication, um, you know, insight, um, and contextual access scenarios. So on the right here, we have a diagram of like what we, how we would map out maybe like an N factor authentication schema, um, which as of right now, you would need to leverage an on-premises ADC to be able to get to that, um, you know, to utilize the N factor technology um, for authentication to the environment. So as of right now, workspace service is natively limited to just OD OTP for MFA and an on-premises ADC would have to be leveraged for, you know, some of these conditional access scenarios so maybe we want to give certain ad groups um, mfa and other ad groups not maybe we want to do some sort of endpoint analysis where we're checking to see if it's domain joined um, and allowing a certain contextual access based on whether the device is domain joined um, so there's a lot that we are have been doing with n factor with our customers over the past four or five years um, that they don't necessarily have the ability to do with workspace today, but you can bring your own ADC to the Citrix cloud control plane 
and you know leverage a triple a v server for authentication um, and kind of forward that traffic on to workspace to be able to leverage um, you know part of the Citrix cloud technology um, the other piece here is smart access. So I know as we're in this COVID area and folks are working from home, um, we wanna be able to provide contextual access for um, users to make sure that they're only getting to resources that we want them to get to if they're connecting in a trusted way. So um, our smart access are basically policies that are applied via ADC session policies, maybe to restrict client drives, uh, maybe restrict printers, copy paste, um, and they're based on um, your, their, your access scenario essentially. And, and because smart access needs to be able to read that ADC session policy today, it requires an on-premises storefront. Okay, so some of the other access to your considerations is around that monitoring and insight data. Um, so today, if you want full end-to-end network metrics um, for the connections that your users are having. Maybe you want to see, um, you know, the network conditions for their actual connection point. Um, then you would need to leverage the HDX Insight and leverage um, ICA proxy through an ADC to be able to gather that information. And you would utilize our ADM functionality to be able to gather that information. Um, similarly, Gateway Insight would provide similar information around authentication, EPA scans, and authentication launch failures. Um, so I think the key piece here that I'm trying to um, emphasize is um, as Lynn Marin, well, Miranda would say, the feature parity with the on-prem product isn't quite there yet. Um, but as Citrix attempted with the service continuity feature is that um, you know, some of this policy-based authentication um, is a goal of the product team and you know, may be coming at some point. Okay, so I've given you some good, given you some gaps. Um, you're probably thinking, okay, you know, what do I do now? Where do I start? Um, so I think some of the, the piece or the, you know, the key takeaway that I want to deliver during this presentation is that there are um, a lot of ways you can get started with the Citrix Cloud um, control plane, um, even considering, you know, where we're at in our Citrix Cloud journey and where you may be at in your Citrix Cloud journey. So the most obvious is the uplift of the CVAD control plane, um, you know, the other pieces are maybe a burst for DR scenario, looking at some of these non CVAD adjacent Citrix products, um, maybe leveraging the control plane for a new use case, which I know is really common during our COVID, um, or, you know, our initial business continuity planning era. Um, with the benefit here being to, to offload management um, and have like an evergreen control plane. Um, some of the compelling events might be some sort of juncture points with an OS application or data center upgrade. Um, or maybe there's some killer CR feature in 2003, 2009, or 2006 that you really want to leverage um, with you know, public cloud workloads. So these are some of the considerations on where to start. So in terms of the easiest place to start, um, some of those adjacent CVAD products are a good place to start. So maybe you want to start looking at analytics or endpoint management or content collab or, you know, WEM. I'm having much more compelling conversations around Workspace Environment Manager these days than I was um, when it was purely an on-premises product because the on-premises product required broker servers, SQL databases, um, a separate console, a lot of infrastructure that had to be stood up just to be able to leverage the WEM technology. Whereas um, with Citrix Cloud, you know, it's just another tile on the page. So, you know, go Citrix for getting away from a thousand different consoles and trying to, to move things into one location, you know, you can see here we have a lot of different tiles that you get access to right from a single control plane. So that's um, definitely exciting for Citrix to move away from a million consoles. Um, and leveraging some of these adjacent CVED products will make the solution a little bit stickier. Um, the other piece is that maybe it makes sense to start with some of these new use cases. So right when our, you know, our pandemic started, we were seeing 
customers want to move forward with leveraging the remote PC technology, leveraging maybe doing a new workload um, on VDI for their business continuity plans. And because they didn't want to resize or re-architect their on-premise environments, they just went ahead and um, moved that control plane right up to CVADS and you know maybe publish the information publish the uh, apps and desktops via storefront so there was no real change to the end users it was just these new use cases the back end was actually being brokered by the citrix cloud control plane instead of in an on premises environment In terms of some other like compelling events or reasons to move up to the Citrix Cloud Control Plane, so you could take like an operating system, an application or data center upgrade as kind of a juncture point. So it, it makes sense to take that transition as an opportunity to get out of the management of the Citrix Control Plane. Um, I know if I were a Citrix admin and I had the decision in front of me on whether or not I wanted to deploy like nine to 12 new infrastructure VMs in a highly available SQL deployment on a per site basis versus being able to just leverage the Citrix evergreen control plane. I know I would probably be pretty compelled to move forward um, with leveraging the Citrix cloud control plane. Um, some of the other compelling events might be, you know, maybe I don't have a super well-developed disaster recovery or burst plan scenario. Um, so maybe I want to be able to leverage Citrix Cloud, maybe a public um, cloud provider, and then auto-scale technology to be able to pretty quickly and easily stand up a disaster recovery plan um, that I maybe didn't have um, before in, in a pretty short period of time. Um, and the reason this is so easy is that extensible infrastructure can really mitigate um, that migration and ease that migration effort because all you really need is you know your two cloud connectors and you're kind of off to the races um, some of the other compelling events maybe you want a new cr feature on public cloud um, so maybe a public cloud workloads that you really want to put on the latest and greatest vda versions um, so, you know, obviously Citrix Cloud Control Plane is the only real way to do that. Um, and then it provides the ability to stay on CR for VDAs because the evergreen control plane um, is there. And then the VD upgrade, VDA upgrade is, you know, really the easiest piece of the puzzle. Um, so because Citrix is managing everything else, um, I'm sure, you know, you guys are logging into your workloads to be able to update applications um, you know, do Windows updates. So just installing a new VDA software is really, you know, the easiest piece of the puzzle there. Okay. So I know we have only a few minutes left, so we're going to run and go through our key takeaways. Um, so I think the key piece here is that, you know, we're getting to, you know, we have dozens of customers with over 10,000 active users, um, you know, we have customers reaching, you know, 30,000 concurrent sessions. Um, and we even have customers use, utilizing like 300 to 400,000 sessions a month via gateway service. Um, so these new technologies are making the transition to Citrix Cloud more convincing than ever, um, which, you know, we've highlighted some of these scale limitations um, that have been increased to the new migration tools that make it easier than ever to move from the on-prem control plane um, up to the Citrix Cloud and some of these new features and services. Um, but, you know, if we're looking at things holistically, you know, the full feature parity doesn't exist for all services yet. Um, and especially we're seeing this around the access tier. So the cool thing is that you don't have to make end user changes to be able to leverage the reduced management of the Citrix Cloud Control Plane and the new features that exist in the Citrix Cloud Control Plane. So you can continue to publish workloads via storefront, keep your on-premises ADCs maybe, and, and uplift that control plane um, first, and maybe do that access tier transition at a later time. Um, and then the other key takeaway is that there's compelling events that help justify the uplift. So, um, you know, we're typically not seeing customers take a perfectly functioning 1912 environment and uplift it. You know, we're seeing um, customers tackling a new use case, uh, maybe leveraging the latest CR or maybe um, really want to get into that evergreen site management as their compelling event to help justify that uplift to the Citrix Cloud Control Plane. Okay. So that's everything I wanted to leave you with. Um, I think we have three minutes left. So I guess if folks have any 
um, questions that they're thinking about. I don't know if we'd have time to get to them right now, but hopefully you're chewing on them um, and we can discuss them during the round table later. Although it does look like we have a few questions in here, actually. So why was localhost cache removed in previous versions? Um, I assume you mean previous to like the 7.13. So localhost cache existed in R6.5 architecture because um, we were utilizing that IMA architecture where the zone data collectors had all of the information um, about the site itself. Oops, this looks like it's running through um, some of these. Let's just leave that on this slide. Whereas once we moved to our FMA architecture, we became much more heavily reliant on the SQL database for those um, actual queries and the decisions on how we were brokering our users to certain BDAs. Um, so we only reintroduced the technology in 7.13 when we were able to kind of re-architect those services and add them to the delivery controllers. Um, and that has existed in the cloud connectors since the, you know, the, the time that the cloud connectors were first introduced is my understanding. Um, but just the key piece here is that you would have to be leveraging storefront to be able to actually um, take advantage of that localhost cache technology um, because there's no way for, you know, anything else in the environment to communicate with the cloud connectors um, to be able to get that information. Okay. Um, okay. And I know we're right at the end, so I know we have two more questions that I can address during the round table. So thanks for attending everyone. I think it might kick you out soon. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, it was uh, really, really in-depth and informative. I think uh, I'm sure a lot of people are going to love that. We did want to um, not to forget uh, our sponsor coming up, iGel. iGel is uh, going to be uh, coming up with this little short video clip right here, and then we'll move on. Make sure that you uh, check out all the vendors and everything else going on and uh, the roundtables. Like Brooke had mentioned, you're going to want to make sure that you uh, see that. All right. So uh, let's move ahead with IGEL or EGEL if you want to pronounce it properly. You can help enable Citrix um, for maybe your new work from home users. So real quickly, a UD Pocket is basically a piece of hardware the size of a small USB key here that can plug into any x86 device. could be Intel AMD base, could be a PC or a Mac. It can boot off it, leaving the original oper operating system working down below. And when it boots, it creates a secure operating system, and then it is then managed by what's called the iGel UMS. I'm going to swap over to a laptop now, and I'll show you exactly how this works. So here you can see is my wife's laptop running Windows. I'm simply going to take the UD Pocket, and pop it in the USB port, and I'm going to reboot this computer and boot from USB. Now, one thing that you are going to definitely notice is that your users will have questions about how to boot from USB. So that might be the biggest operational lift when you're talking about how to actually address that is, hey, you have Dells, you have Lenovo's, you have HP, how do I uh, enable boot from USB? So we do have a KB article on iGEL's website that shows you um, some of the common commands between those different vendors. The other thing that we can do here is we can pretty much operate in any uh, BIOS environment, right? It could be legacy boot, it could be UEFI boot, it even could be secure boot. We can operate in under any of those conditions. I'm just going to quickly choose USB storage device under legacy boot and get right into the iGEL OS. As you can see here, the uh, logo is shown in the bottom right-hand corner, and within about 10 to 15 more seconds, we're going to be at the iGEL screen. 
So the other thing that I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to bounce over to our management server and show you exactly how things are done from that end um, once the device is booted. So you can see it's linking up and it's going to get those policies from that management server. So now I'm going to move over to the management server and show you exactly what that looks like. Okay. So here you can see the IGEL management server. Um, here I have a folder called Citrix. And the way that the UMS works is very similar to Active Directory. You create policies um, based on one of the numerous features found in IGEL. You create your own unique directory structure and you drag and drop and enable those policies uh, based on how you have things organized, very Active Directory-like. So here on the Citrix folder, I have things like enable Wi-Fi, uh, the Citrix session um, that I have pre-set up things like my username and password. You can create variables for your users that are based there and some other things. Um, the one I wanted to highlight and to show you is what's called secure shadowing. It enables you to take and create a secure VNC connection to any of your IGEL devices um, that you have managed under the UMS. So you can see here, this is the actual uh, uh, laptop that I have running with the UD Pocket at this point. So I'm going to quickly double-click my Citrix workspace. And you can see here I have those credentials pre-stored. So it's logging into Citrix storefront, and it's going to grab all the different applications that I have that I want published. Uh, from an IGEL perspective, we respect whatever the publishing mechanisms and rules that you have inside of Citrix to be able to put those on the desktop. So you can say, hey, you know, I want to either put it into a kiosk mode that shows all the different things kind of up here, or maybe I just want to show um, certain applications plus the desktop that are living on the IGEL desktop. And there you go. You see those happening right now. So here's like an on-prem desktop. I can quickly click on this. It's going to create uh, that connection to a VDI desktop primarily running on-prem. One of the things about IGEL that's unique is that we can connect to your apps, your data, your uh, workspaces, as you can see here, they can be on-prem, they can be in the cloud, wherever they may be, you can connect to those. Here's also Microsoft Word that I'll start up as well to kind of show what a published application looks like. So there's my uh, Windows 10 desktop uh, running on Citrix that I can get to any of my resources like Office 365 through a web browser there um, or through an installed um, Office set of applications. But you can also see I'm also logging in um, within IGEL to get to my Microsoft Word piece as well. So here I'm going to, and there's the, the Microsoft Word that's running natively as a published application. So I'm going to close out on my desktop here, and I'm going to show you what it looks like when you're actually done working. What does a user see, right? I mean, what do they experience? So I'm done working in Word, right? I'm going to log off my Citrix environment, and I'm going to go back and stop sharing my screen and go back to the actual laptop view. As you can see here, everything's removed. All you, ha you have to do is simply remove the UD pocket. At that point, the laptop turns off, and I can turn it back on, and it'll boot right into the native operating system that's installed. So again, my, uh, my wife's computer using Windows, it'll boot right back into that.